We'll be reading all of Psalm 32, and we'll be focusing especially in verse 3, but many verses surrounding this whole psalm. To the chief musician, uh, Mashiel, for the sons of Korah. Mashiel gives the meaning of, of a song for instruction. Hear God's own inspired and eternal word, Psalm 42, beginning in verse 1. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night. While they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with the multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites from the hill Mizar. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God my rock, Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. Thus far, may God bless the reading of his own word. Amen. I invite you then to have God's Word open in Psalm 42. And if some of you may remember, this is the very psalm we looked at one year ago, last Good Friday service. And when I was looking at my notes, I noticed and remembered that um, the very following Sunday, we preached also on Psalm 42. As you noticed, there, there are these two themes, an, an amazing combination. Um, and truly, you could say in the greatest of intents, you have the deepest of sorrows in this psalm, and you have the greatest of hopes and expectation. And we saw um, elements here of the very resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, because after the death of Jesus, where the greatest sorrow was manifested and demonstrated and felt in the bosom of the Lord Jesus, in resurrection day, there was the great glorious moment of, of, of joy. And in my notes, it was written for that Sunday of Resurrection Sunday, um, that it was the fourth day of the lockdown. And so we're basically here at one year or so um, and month after those those lockdowns and those months of lockdowns. And so that means that on Good Friday of last year, um, there were probably just about 10, 12 people here. Everyone else. And I remember having even noticed the, the reality and commented on it. And it was most of us would have been at home when we spoke of the tears of David And the reality that what he was longing for was the presence of God, but the presence of God was connected with the people of God. And it just brought joy to my heart to think that we could go back to this passage and now not anymore in exile, as it were, of sorts, but most of us who could be here to be here and to 
to be witnessing the reality. And isn't it what perhaps you have been learning from all of this, that there's nothing that substitutes the corporate worship of God? Nothing. And in this psalm, David is literally saying that in his yearning for God, it made him remember the people of God. And it was when he was with the people of God that he experienced the presence of God. So that if we're here this evening, and this is why we should never miss any service that the Bible, that, that the God's people bring to open the Bible where we can worship Him, because where God's people are united corporately, especially in worship, and yes, especially in a climactic way on the Lord's Day, because that, that is the day that He calls to worship. But what happens in corporate worship in this holy day is that God is present with us. And if you have this yearning, if you have this this desire, it is met, it is satisfied when you meet with God's people. And David couldn't meet with his people. And so he thirsted after God. So verse 2, he says, My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? But he's not thinking appear before God and that he dies and appear before God. Look at the train of thought. My tears have been my meat day and night while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? So there's persecution out there. There's sorrow in here. But then he says, when I remember these things, I pour out my soul. Here's still the theme of crying. The word pour out is the idea of water being poured out. So he's not just crying with his eyes, he's crying with his soul. For I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise, with the multitude that kept holy day. That's when he appeared before God. See, when shall I come and appear before God? Well, I used to come and appear before God when I would go with the multitude up to the temple where the sacrifice was done and where worship was conducted. And, and I'm longing for that. See, he was longing for God and longing for worship. And last Good Friday, we had to worship the Lord with our families, which is, in a sense, the second best Yes, worshiping with our family is wonderful, and we should keep doing it. But can you imagine those who are alone at home? And that's, in a sense, the third best, the, the individual worship. And we're all called to do that. We're all called to read our Bibles and have a personal devotion. And then we should do it with our families. And then we should do it corporately. But this is always the climax. And, and what a blessing, what a day of thanksgiving as well. Before thanksgiving um, comes again, we just had thanksgiving, but soon it, it almost seems like thanksgiving season, so I was thinking it was soon. Before thanksgiving comes, we have so much to be thankful. Beloved, I, I can just share in a, in a couple words, and you, you may have heard, even from other pastors, if you have heard on sermon audio, pastors commenting to the congregation that they never had realized how important it was to have everyone there. And we, we make s- such a focus on the preaching, and rightly so. The word is central. But the only reason we have the word is because there are souls to be preached to. And it is a very sad thing to preach to a camera or to preach to to just a few people. And then if you think this is my congregation, that's fine. Then this is my congregation. But when you think there are more and they can't be there, there's, there's this longing. It's akin to David's here in this psalm. And the sight of the souls and the eyes that are looking the nods of the head and, and the occasional maybe, maybe a sound or so that may come. All of these things are part of worship. And as I'm communicating to you God's word, you are communicating to the preacher that you love God's word, that you desire to hear it, that you believe in it because you're, you're more with a, with a sense of favor than with a frown. 
Now, there have been moments that I have preached and I have seen in a, in a face in a certain situation where, where somebody is kind of wondering, is, is that really true? And with a certain sense of a frown. And, it, and it's, it's, a, it's a very sad thing to see in a congregation. If, if you're just so certain of what you're preaching, something of a clear truth, and yet you see someone not accepting it, almost like a wall before him. And that communicates to the preacher, but not necessarily in a negative way because the Spirit gives power and strength and, and may even use that to make it where the preacher has to be more forceful about how true it is what he is saying. And then if he is there saying that truth and there are those who are there nodding and listening and young people, this is why you, you preach a wonderful sermon to me knowing that you're, you're not looking at other things or distracted or writing something, maybe your notes, which is wonderful. But you see that attention and again, it communicates and encourages the preacher and that wasn't able, that was not possible by, by all of us in, in not too long ago. And so we have reason to be thankful and even mindful and in, 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 in with sympathy that, as we understand, there's still churches where they're having to struggle with this very reality, especially in Canada. There are a few places where they've had a second shutdown and then reopening and then another shutdown. And they're experiencing a lot of what this very psalmist was experiencing. So this is a, uh, an introduction. But we, what we hope to see in this psalm is, like I said, focused on verse 3. My tears have been my meat day and night. And we will see um, brief, um, in brief ways five things that describe these tears. Five things about these tears. Um, and these tears, we know, were from the psalmist primarily in the sense of, of his experience. And like I said, we, we do believe this could have been David. And if it was David, it could have been perhaps when he was being chased by Saul or, or chased by his son Absalom. There were many moments in his life where, where he had enemies and who were, they were taunting him and they were criticizing him that, that where, where would God be there to, to help him? Remember when he fled from Absalom, Shimei, um, by the brook Kidron, as, as David fled into the wilderness, Shimei um, cursed David and, and was basically saying, where will God be now to deliver you? So some people attribute to that moment in time. And David would have had his tears. But we know that David, especially in his kingly office and as a shepherd of Israel, was a type of Christ. And these tears would be the tears of Christ in the most supreme way. And so what, let's see what these tears can teach us. Well, the first thing is that these were sincere tears. These were sincere tears. Not every tear is always sincere, but usually tears have always, I, can, I shouldn't say always, usually tears have a mark of genuineness. It's very hard to fake tears. We, we understand it can happen. And then that's what people do in drama. They try to make tears come. But these are genuine tears. And tears that seal the sincerity of his soul. When we think of David, um, he had these tears and he, and he says exactly why. Because, um, because there were these enemies taunting him. Where is thy God? And he was missing God because he was missing worship. He's feeling later down um, in verse in verse 9, he, he even felt that God had forgotten him. Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? So David's tears would have been sincere because of his suffering. But no tear has ever been shed in this world more sincere than the tears of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were so sincere that we will have a second point to speak even more profoundly of, of this sincerity. Jesus could not fake tears. Jesus never had a moment where he falsified his tears. They were all true. 
There, there are three moments in the life of Jesus that we know of tears. There may have been more. I do believe there must have been many more times. But the times that we know that are registered is, remember, before the tomb, before the grave of Lazarus, when he saw the people mourning the reality of death and how it affected his friends. And it says, Jesus wept. It's the shortest verse of the Bible, those two words, Jesus wept. And those were sincere tears. There's a little, uh, there's a, a, a confusion, not really confusion, but a, there's a wonder as to why precisely Jesus wept. Was it because he felt sorry for the people? Was it because he, he saw the reality of death and how it affects people? And was it because he missed in his humanity Lazarus and, and, and had an element of simply showing his love for him? Or possibly a combination of all these things. But the one thing we know for sure is that they were sincere. That they were absolutely, purely Truthful tears. And then the tears, as he looked upon Jerusalem and saw the lost sheep of Israel, it also says that he wept as they considered that Israel was like sheep that didn't have a shepherd. And those were sincere, truthful tears. Jesus genuinely felt sorry for people who did not realize how lost they were and that he was their very savior. He was the one they were supposed to follow and they really didn't have that understanding in their hearts. And then the third moment of tears is, of course, we understand when the Lord Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, where those tears that he shed were were combined with sweat and great drops of blood. It was as if his very skin was now weeping along with his eyes. And those were sincere tears as well. And, and to, to even go deeper into the sincerity, we can say that these were sanctified tears. That's how sincere these tears were. They, were. they were not just sincere in that they were of a pure feeling and a pure emotion that he was not faking. They were pure in the sense of holiness and not sanctified tears in that they had to be made sanctified. And so before I talk about the tears of Christ, let me go back to the tears of David. See, David, I would say, also had many sincere tears, but Every single tear that David shed was mingled with his own sin. And so many of his tears were because of the predicaments that he brought himself in because of his sins. So that as he's shedding tears, they have been, been made, made very pure and full of repentance. But it was all because of sin. And David would be the first one to say that even his tears of repentance were not pure and perfect tears. And, and think just the thought, if you're weeping because you sinned, how pure can those tears be? You're, you're weeping because sin was committed. Now let's go immediately to the tears of Jesus. Every tear, every teardrop that irrigated this ground coming from the Lord Jesus was pure. Never the earth saw. Never the earth, you could say, was irrigated by tears more pure, perfectly pure, than when the Savior wept. And you could say, well, Adam and Eve, wouldn't they have had pure tears? No. Because before the fall, Adam and Eve would have no reason to cry you could say they were so happy that maybe tears flowed in the sense that could tears flow when you were very happy before the fall? We don't know, but let's think of tears of sadness. Adam and Eve had no tears of sadness while they were pure, while they were in innocence. And the moment they fell, yes, many tears, but none of them pure, perfectly pure. The tears of believers are sanctified by the blood of Christ. That's how the tears of David can be spoken of as sanctified. But the tears of Jesus, see, the tears of Jesus are the ones that sanctify yours and make them holy. 
Because his were holy. They weren't made holy. They were sincere tears. They were sanctified tears. And then we can also say that they were satisfied tears. And I think this is important to say because of the very verse that says, My tears have been my meat day and night. There's a sense where the psalmist is saying, it could be that he has no food, but the idea seems to be even if he had food, he wanted none because his tears were feeding him. There's a sense where the tears were his sustenance. And he was satisfied with his tears, salty as they may have been. He really had no f- desire for food because there was a satisfaction in the very tears. And Spurgeon says this, his Um, Appetite was gone. His tears not only seasoned his meat, but became his only meat. He had no mind for another diet. There was a satisfaction. Um, And and this is is what the satisfaction is. I desire Jesus. I desire God. And He's the only one who will satisfy me. And, And until I have Him, my tears are enough. I don't need food. I don't need to go to other comforts. See, he's not desiring the comfort of his home. He's not desiring a new house. He's not desiring even to be back in the palace so much. He wants to be back in the temple where he will be in the presence of God. And so it's only God who will satisfy him. And so those tears are bringing some satisfaction in terms of everything worldly. Uh, Nothing in this world will satisfy me. And as for food, I'll just keep crying, and that's my food, day and night. They are sincere tears, sanctified tears, satisfied tears, and we could say also, to help boys and girls remember, and all of us really, I know this helps, sacrificial tears. These were sacrificial tears. And again, if we begin with David, it's true of him too, because as David served in the office of king, He served sacrificially. Every position of leadership involves sacrifice. And in this sense, if the people um, invade the nation, the king will have to answer. If a company goes haywire, the CEO will have to answer. And so every position of leadership, it comes with it, the reality of sacrifice. And for King David not to live a life of sacrifice, he had only to abdicate being king. But he never did, and rightly so, because he was the king after God's own heart. And as a king, it was a position of sacrifice. And that's why he's the one ousted out of the city. He's the one who's pursued, and he's the one whom the enemies are seeking to prevail against. Because it's an element of sacrifice. Now let's take it to the Lord Jesus. And these were sacrificial tears. And especially if we think of these tears, beloved, and I think there is this climax where we, where we see in this psalm where the Lord Jesus is here um, showing elements of his suffering and of his death. And even when it speaks of, of, of the psalmist saying um, that he feels that God has forgotten me. Why hast thou forgotten me? Well, it was on the cross that the Lord Jesus felt this in a climactic way. And really at the only time, never Jesus felt that God forgotten him until he was on the cross. And he said, why hast thou forsaken me? Which is a way to say, why have you forgotten me? So these are the tears of Christ in a sacrificial way. It is the Lord Jesus offering, as it were, his his body and his tears. And he, he is being a sacrifice for sin. And the victim is weeping because it's a man, not a lamb. And you can imagine a lamb and an ox, whatever it would be that you would kill and slaughter, whatever pain and hurt that animal would feel, there would be that animal weeping to whatever degree that there's still life in the animal. But before the Lord Jesus gave his full life, he lived for a good while and with a lot of weeping. And that's why in our forms it speaks of of sin already being impugned upon Christ, um, um, placed upon, imputed upon Christ, we believe, even already at Gethsemane 
really the form says in all of Christ's life, there was already the sense of his bearing our sins. But then it says, remember, in the Lord's Supper form, where especially there at Gethsemane, where it pressed upon our Savior so profoundly that it brought forth blood from his sweat pores. And that's where Christ wept sacrificially. And, and, and then you need to realize that all of his weeping while he lived was also sacrificially because during his life, the Lord Jesus was a, a sacrifice for sin in, in, in his blamelessness. He was learning righteousness. He, he was showing himself as a blameless lamb of God. So already a sacrifice in waiting, you could say. But then as, as the cross arrives, it is sacrifice every moment of the way. So that a sacramental bread was his last meal and tears were his last bread, was his last bread. So even as Jesus is there offering the Lord's Supper, beloved, think this last Lord's Day we had the privilege to be around the table. And you can imagine the Lord Jesus passing that bread and saying, eat, this is my body. And then passing the wine cup and saying that that is the cup in the new covenant in my blood. You wonder if Christ wept at the supper as he considered, I'm, I'm about to be given a sacrifice for sinners. These were sacrificial tears. And finally, fifthly, so sincere, satisfied, sanctified, sacrificial tears. But because they're sacrificial tears, we need to fulfill, to finish this in a concluding way. These were substitutionary tears. And boys and girls, young people, this is where um, I hope all of this is, is very personal to you and even experiential. But in a way, here we see why and how this is so experiential to your own soul. Why do I say substitutionary? Well, let's go back to David again. David, as a king, he was suffering for the kingdom. He was, he was, a, he was a king, so it was a sacrificial position. There was danger involved. This is a moment of great danger. They, we, we don't read of all his servants writing psalms of their own suffering. They, they did their suffering, but, but the servants were probably left. Many of them were left in Israel, and they were fine. But those who had higher position, the higher you have, the more you were suffering in a sacrificial way, in behalf of the kingdom. See, every sacrifice is in behalf of who you sacrifice for. This is why they're sacrifice, because you are a substitution. So even if I go back to those examples that enemies enter into a city, well, it's the king who have to answer because now he will have to respond to what all the people are suffering. This big company is suffering great, suffering great loss and, and, and the CEO has not been mindful. Well, a lot of people are being unemployed. A lot of people are being injured. Well, now the CEO will have to answer in behalf of the people. Again, it's those two things. If you're a leader, whether you like it or not, it is a sacrifice and you are a substitute. The same thing happens to the father in a home. When God tells us to love our spouse and for the spouse to be submissive to the husband, it is the husband who's told to die in behalf of his wife so that his wife and children live. Sacrifice and substitution. And when we think of the Lord Jesus, he was a sacrifice and substitute for his people. So that these tears were tears that Jesus shed so that you who believe in him won't. I'm not saying that as a believer you'll never shed tears. Of course you will. Here's David and he was a believer and he was shedding tears. And Jesus comes into this world and he sheds tears. But the tears of Jesus were substitutionary. He was shedding tears because he was a sacrifice 
for sinners and for sin. He was feeling upon his very bosom as if he were the greatest sinner. And he was receiving from heaven the very wrath of the Father. And it is all these realities that caused him to weep. And the people were hating and there was betrayal and there was scourging. Everything that brought forth weeping from, Je- from the Lord Jesus Christ. He was doing that so that you, if you believe in Him and trust Him as your Lord and Savior, you'll never have to have those kinds of tears. Eternal tears of sorrow because your sins would commit your soul to a place of no return. And those are not tears that are sacrificial enough in the sense that you can one day leave hell. That will never happen. Hell is a place, you could say, of eternal weeping. And not even weeping with true repentance. There's nothing true and pure happening to souls in hell. But the weeping that is there and the moaning and all of that is because their sins are upon them. See, the suffering and grief that Jesus experienced on the cross is akin to the suffering and grief that a soul and a body will experience in hell forever. It is what we deserve. See, that's what Jesus suffered. He suffered what you and I deserve. And all the weeping is part of that so that when you trust in Him, you will not have that suffering. You will not have that eternal moaning and groaning. And you will not have the weeping. Because the weeping of Jesus was substitutionary. And when we weep here, we're we're really weeping because of how we've offended God. We're weeping because we disobeyed mom and dad. We weep because we, we dishonored a loved one. In all of this, we dishonored God. And it's rightful for us to weep. But none of this weeping is substitutionary. None of this weeping pays for our sins. But the weeping of Jesus does. And so I just want to conclude, beloved. Do you believe that Jesus had these tears? That they were sanctified? That they were sincere? That he was satisfied? In, in, in desiring God and nothing else, that they were sacrificial tears and that they were substitutionary ones. When you ask Him to save you and to forgive you of your own sins, in a way you're asking, Lord, may those tears have been for me. Lord, that Thou did weep for me because I deserve this eternal weeping. I deserve an eternal scourging. I deserve to be betrayed. I deserve to be lonely. This is how evil my sin is, Lord. And I, and I confess it. And I own it. And I acknowledge that everything that thou did suffer, Lord, on earth and on the cross especially, shows what I deserve, shows who I am. But I need thee. So, Lord, save me. And I shall never weep this kind of weeping forever. Jesus said, My tears have been my meat day and night. The Lord Jesus had tears when it was light time on the cross. He had tears when it was dark. It's amazing to think that Jesus experienced both daytime and nighttime while he was on the cross. And this is precisely what was happening. If he could hear the multitudes in a summary, it was, where is thy God? If you are the Savior, if you are the Messiah, come down and we'll believe in you. You trusted in him. Won't we bless you now? These were the very taunts. The Lord Jesus even exclaimed from the cross in the darkness, Why hast thou forgotten me? Look at verse 9. I will say unto God my rock, Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? You see, these are echoes from the very cross of the Lord Jesus. Very likely lived in the life of David, but fulfilled in the life of Jesus. And that is where these tears were this precious. And may you and I say, even with the psalmist, even with the Lord, why art thou cast down, O my soul? 
If you don't trust Jesus, if you don't love Jesus, if you're not protected by these tears of Jesus, by his blood that was shed on the cross, your soul will be cast down. And it's understandable why you would be disquieted within you. But may every one of us say, hope thou in God to our own soul. Teach your soul who to look to. Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. May each and every one of us find our comfort, even as we focus upon the sufferings of Jesus and are mindful of what he did, and he did that because of sin, that it would turn your heart and mind away from sin, that we would be reminded again to hate sin and to love our dear and glorious Savior in the tears that he shed for his own. And if you do not know if those tears were for you, what you must plead is, Lord, forgive me, save me. Don't trust that your tears are what will save you, but go to the one whose tears were in a sacrifice that will. Amen. Let us close in prayer. Our gracious, glorious God Almighty, how we thank Thee, Lord, for the tears of the Lord Jesus Christ. They marked His humanity and thus showing that He is a true substitute for me, for us. These were not tears of angels. These were not tears um, that, that had nothing to do with humanity. It came out of His very humanity. It marked and it sealed the truthfulness of His ministry. And it also revealed the depths of the sadness that He was undergoing because He was a sin offering in our behalf. Lord, as we focus upon the death of Christ and thankful that He died for us, we plead, Lord, that each and every one would find their comfort in these sincere and sacrificial, satisfied, sanctified, and substitutionary tears of Christ. That in their own tears, they would be comforted that the tears of Christ are redeeming tears so that we never need to have tears of despair and tears of, of, of great darkness, but that our tears would even be tears of joy. Help us, Lord, to weep when we sin and that our tears would be sincere. Lord, comfort those who have tears because of loved ones who depart and who go before us. Lord, it is always so grieving to see people die, and especially if lost ones do die. Lord, how can we keep the tears from coming? We look for the day in which every tear will be wiped away because these tears were shed, the very tears of Christ. We pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.